Today we will we'll be reading from Romans 7, 14 through 8, 2. Struggling with sin. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself for what I want to do. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. If you'll bow your heads in prayer with me. Father, we thank you for the power that leads to salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are the one who is able to overcome the darkness that is within us and without us in the world. Father, we just pray for this time together that we receive instruction from your heart through Trey's mouth to our ears and into our world and communities that we get to serve in and live in today. We love you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That is such a relatable passage, is it not? Uh, I find that all the time. Uh, you know, I told myself I would you know, stop snapping back and instead hold my tongue. And then I don't. I find it in serious things. I find it in not so serious things. Uh, I find it for me like when I eat pizza. Uh, do you guys know like when you're eating, it doesn't have to be pizza, but this is the one place that I really find it. Uh, there's a balance between that place where you're like healthily satisfied and if you eat just like one bit more, you move into super uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And I too often cross that line. Even after I tell myself, you know what's going to happen if you eat one more piece. You enjoy it right now, and you're not going to enjoy it if you pass over this line. And yet I find myself doing the same thing over and over again. I've got a part of me that wants to eat more pizza and a part of me that knows, Trey, you probably ought not do that. I suspect that you, like me, have a battle raging inside of you, a battle of desires, of wants, of loves, a part of you that wants that extra piece of pizza and a part of you that says, I really shouldn't. A part that wants to become a kinder person, but another part that finds yourself saying some less than kind things when you get cut off in traffic. A part of you that wants to forgive and another part that is scared of what might happen if you do. A part of you that is angry against injustice and yet another part tells you not to be angry. A part of you that is grieving and then another part that belittles you for grieving because surely you shouldn't anymore. I suspect you, like me, have regular battles raging in your mind, your heart, and body over big things, over seemingly trivial things. No wonder we're all so tired. Like Paul here in the book of Romans, maybe you too have discovered this principle of life, that when you want to do what is right, you inevitably do what is wrong. 
it's an awful feeling to find yourself doing the same thing you had recently just told yourself you would never do again. You promised you'd quit next time before you had that one too many, that you'd turn off your computer and go outside when you felt the temptation come up. You told yourself you would hold your tongue, but here you find yourself again. Here I find myself again, doing the same thing that I promised myself I wouldn't do again. And then I have a part of me that feels super guilty. Then I have another part of me that tells me it's okay. And a whole lot more parts than that. What part is right? There's no simplistic solution to this internal battle. It's a reality of the state of our world and our formation because we are not yet fully who we are created to be. So of course, there's an internal dissonance between who I'm made to be and who I presently am. Parts holding on to the status quo and other parts wanting something different. Some are angry about it. Some are sad about it. Some are motivated about it. Some are fine with it. No wonder we're so tired. While no pithy platitude will fix this, we do learn some things from Paul's writings to the church in Rome that will help us make sense of what is going on inside of us. Though these writings were from around 2,000 years ago, they offer some powerful insight for what it means to be human and the battle that we face in our minds, our hearts, and our bodies. And understanding this conflict will help us learn better how to respond to it. So this text takes place after a lengthier section of Scripture concerning the inclusion of Jews and Gentiles and the people of God. It details sin, the law, and tendencies towards exclusion and then inclusion to the family of God by putting our trust in Jesus. Romans 3 says it like this in verse 21 and 22. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true. For everyone who believes, no matter, matter who we are. Amazing, right? We are able to have a relationship with God, not through earning it or doing enough, but through putting faith in Jesus, we are able to be made right with God. But my guess is, you probably don't spend your time at night as your mind's running thinking about Gentiles and whether or not they are included into the family of God. You probably don't spend your time, hmm, what do I do about this part of the law? Unless you're a lawyer and you're thinking of something different, but I don't think we have any lawyers in here today. So why does this matter? Let me reframe this. Uh, in this passage, in other places in the book of Romans, we see repeated words of the law and sin. Uh, what are both of those things? Because both of these things have a lot of caricatures. So the law here is referring to the law of Moses. So the law often would refer to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And within the law, there were not only 10 commandments, but anybody got a guess on how many commandments there were? A lot, yeah, hundreds, 613 commandments. That's a lot of them. But the law, uh, in some ways our English version of saying the law doesn't totally make sense of what the law would actually refer to. It was not just a series of commandments, it was a story. A story about God and his people. And Jesus says later on in the story that he was the fulfillment of the law. And he said that all of the law and the prophets could be summed up in these two commands. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength, and the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. So then we get to sin. Now my guess is you've probably uh, heard or seen people talked about sin. You probably immediately think of, depending on your background, uh, angry preachers, road signs, maybe people who have a sin that you don't particularly like. I don't know. You, you probably have a lot of caricatures. So in the scripture, Scriptures, there's a couple words that get at what we might refer to as sin. Some might be sin, iniquity, transgression. But here is a word that in its most basic meaning means to fail or to miss the goal. So like uh, in the scriptures, it could even be not for a moral thing. Now here it is a moral thing. Like if I was trying to go to Memphis and I ended up going to Chattanooga, I would have sinned, failed, missed the mark. So the question becomes, what then is the mark? The mark would be if the law is summed up in to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The mark would be that. Sinning is anything not living up into that standard. It's a failure to full, be fully, fully human, missing the mark of God's standard. In the scriptures, people often would fail or sin without even knowing that's what they were doing. And perhaps even scarier, 
sinning, thinking you were doing what was right. We see this exemplified through people like Pharaoh enslaving the Israelite people, thinking he was doing what was good. The Bible Project has an excellent series on, um, I think they call it bad words in the Bible, which is just funny to me. But uh, they have one on this particular word, sin, and they, they outline it as three things. One, failure to be humans who fully love God and others. Two, an inability to judge whether we are succeeding or failing. It's almost kind of like blinders on our eyes. And then three, that deep selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. If I was to say it in a, a different kind of way too, I think a lot of times when we think of sin, we think of sins, plural, as opposed to the concept of sin. So those are the terms, and these things bring up some tension. So to get at this, I want to offer a couple caricatures of Jesus that I think we fall into. So we are in a series called A Christ-Haunted People, which comes from a line from uh, Flannery O'Connor, who was a Southern novelist, who said that the South is perhaps uh, less so Christ-centered and more so Christ-haunted. Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor, referring to Flannery O'Connor's work, said that we have, are left with these forms of Christianity without substance. In other words, we have these outlines of things that have truth within them, but they are left without actually the substance that makes them really deeply meaningful. And they leave us haunted. And certainly when it comes to things like religious obligation and conversations about sin, many of us have been haunted by things like religious requirements and obligations put on us by others. We have been haunted by conversations that people have had about sin. Maybe because the sins you heard talked about were your sins. Or maybe because they were that of a friend and you didn't understand the preacher would only talk about their sins and not his or her sins. Certainly, many of us have been haunted by things like religious requirements and obligations. Maybe we're haunted by our own sin things that we've done or sin that has been done to us. Maybe we're haunted by our internal conflicts, parts that want to trust God and yet parts that want to do anything but that. Parts that want to obey God, but want to obey God not out of love, but out of religious obligation or to make God happy with you. So what we're doing in this series is each week, I'm offering some caricatures of our perceptions of God or the world or us to get at this. The idea is not that you will fit neatly into one of these caricatures, uh, but perhaps that you might find yourself in one more so than the other or both, and more likely, you will probably find parts of you that resonate with each one. Uh, today, I threw in some memes to make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more enjoyable. So if the image quality is bad on any of these memes, they're meant to be sent on a phone, so they're on a big screen. So we'll see how bad they look. So the ones today deal with the tension of the law and sin. So here are the two, hyper-religious Jesus and then an anti-religious or buddy Jesus. So the hyper-religious Jesus, uh, perhaps, um, have you all seen that before, that meme? Okay, it's a very popular meme. If you can find it, uh, just type in buddy Jesus. So hyper-religious Jesus is perhaps an under-emphasis on our shortcomings to fulfill the law and an under-emphasis on the importance of love as the motivation for obeying the law. So this caricature might hold very strong religious requirements. These might be self-imposed or others-imposed. Often it's caricaturized, in my mind, by lots of shoulds and shouldn'ts. Lots of commands, lots of obligations, lots of duties, things that you have to do, have to think, have to be in order to be in this group of people. And as soon as you start doing any of those things, if you cuss too much, you drink too much, or you question one of these particular things that are held to really closely, then all of a sudden you are out of the crew. Often, the requirements can become a way of making God happy with you or pleased with you. If you're not doing enough or doing it right, God is probably disappointed with you. That may be explicitly taught or may just be implicitly felt. This is exemplified in the scriptures by people like the Pharisees, Sadducees, and other religious leaders who knew the right things, a lot of the right things, but yet missed Jesus standing in front of them. They weren't doing it out of proper motivation. Now, Jesus would have agreed with them on a lot of things that they taught and thought, but they missed the point. So that's one. The second one, uh, in some ways, might be like a, oftentimes we go pendulums, pendulum swings, would be kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, but I think they're actually pretty similar would be that of the anti-religious or buddy Jesus. Uh, This would be perhaps an under-emphasis on the benefit of the law, caricaturized in some uh, phrases that offer some truth but uh, lack some nuance that I think would be helpful. 
popular ones would be like, I love Jesus, but I hate religion. I'm spiritual, but not religious. A relationship, not a religion. All these things have very good truth in there as well. Uh, so you may find yourself pushing back against things that feel like legalism or some form of religious requirements. Statements of right and wrong, anything with a should on it. Often, in its caricature, can lead to a really negative reading of the Old Testament or anything pertaining to the law. And in a heavy caricature, uh, may neglect the Old Testament because of the internal dissonance that you feel concerning what you think about the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. So, for example, this is a very common, uh, common one. Martin Luther, who was a crucial figure in the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, struggled with the book of James, uh, which James, if you've ever read it, deals a lot with faith and works, or it has a line in there, that works is dead. It deals with faith, works, and all that type of stuff. So he said this about James. Therefore, St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to these others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. So a couple ways these play out. This is not an exhaustive list, but um, it certainly is a list. It's, um, it is a list, so that's what it is. Uh, first is pride. So some form of thinking you're better than other people. Hyper-religious version would be thinking you are better than all the people out there who do all the wrong things in your mind. Here are the good people, and everybody out there is just going to hell. Like, they're awful. Anti-religious Jesus or buddy Jesus would be like immediately rejecting anything that seems religious, thinking that you're better than those hyper-religious folk. And you certainly aren't one of those religious folk. This would lead to kind of an obvious response of some form of finger pointing, which is pointing out what is wrong in other people more than you point them out in yourself. You mainly point it out. So the hyper-religious would be pointing out all the problems there out there in the world. So that could be those Republicans, those Democrats, those Protestants, those Catholics, those you fill in the blank, whatever you want to fill in there without really doing the inner work. Uh, the anti-religious one would be more so pointing out the problems with religious people without really doing the inner work. Both the caricature would be the problem is out there, not in here. And then you've got another caricature, which is me, and there's a meme for this one, which is in some ways identifying pointing a finger at those pointing a finger at those pointing a finger. To make it really clear, and I'm not going to do this with every one of these, um, it is really, there, there's a caricature when it comes to like talking about sin out there that some Christians dive into like we're not supposed to judge or say things that out there are wrong. That's not what I'm saying. It is important to call out evil that is out there in the world. That is very important, especially in issues of injustice. Um, I think we see that clearly in the prophetic literature and in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, but, but the thing is, you also have to realize that you've got it in here. Um, and even when you move into calling out the injustice, we all still have it in here. Uh, so if you're trying to wait until you fully arrive, you're not going to get there either. So uh, next one would be fear. So the hyper-religious version of this would be, I will never live up. I'm scared of what might happen if people find out what I've done. Or I'm scared of what might happen if I gave into this urge that I've always had. I think God is probably disappointed if he was to think about me. I don't do enough. Maybe you are scared of sin. Anti-religious version would be, I'm scared of what might happen if I do anything religious because I don't want to be looked at as one of those people. Maybe afraid of the law or what you believe is the law. This all leads to what I would refer to as like disordered conviction. The hyper-religious conviction might be a, a primary conviction concerning what is wrong with the world and what we ought to do to fix it. And an anti-religious conviction might be convinced that religion in and of itself is a key problem that needs to be fixed. Both of these caricatures have strong elements of truth and beauty that I think are affirmed in the scriptures. I want to make that clear. Uh, but I think they lack some nuance that actually provides a fuller, more beautiful, more compelling picture. St. Augustine, who is an influential philosopher and theologian from the mid-300s to around the year 430, uh, talked about a disordered heart. And he said, it may not be that we love the wrong things, but that we love the right things in the wrong order. A disordered heart. So perhaps the things in this are not just like those things are bad. It's just perhaps that our priorities are out of sorts, leading to a disordered heart. And you feel this, right? You find yourself caring more about things that you wish you didn't care about. And you find yourself not caring about the things that you really deeply wish you did. 
These things are a lot to carry, and no wonder literally all of us feel tired because you find a battle within you, and of course you do. There's a battle between the shoulds and the can'ts, a battle where you should be reading your Bible more, should be drinking less, should be less angry, should be you fill in the blank, but you can't seem to make it happen. A battle between a part of you that is hyper-religious and another part that is seemingly anti-religious and tells you the religious part is killing you. A part of you that tells you you're loved and another part that's always telling you no one likes you, no one cares about you. So what is the problem? It's the law. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Well then, and am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? And at this point, if I was reading through, I would, if I was hearing this directly from Paul, because he's diving into this does not, you cannot fulfill it, you cannot do enough. He says, of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. And then he goes on in verse 13. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's command for its own evil purposes. Dang. So learning what is good and right and what is wrong doesn't actually fix my problem. I can't pick up a book that says 10 steps to being a less angry you. And now I am no longer angry at the wrong things. Great, 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 great. And actually, I can know the right things to do, and even when I know the right things, that then can be used in, to make me do the evil thing. So do I not try to know? I mean, haven't you experienced that? Like you knew what you weren't supposed to do, and what it did was the equivalent of someone telling you not to think about a pink elephant? And then, of course, all you can do is what? Think about a pink elephant. I remember for me, there was one particular sin that I really, really struggled with, and I, and I devoted a lot of time and energy and thought and emotional, I don't know, guilt and other stuff to like trying to not do the thing. And me spending so much time thinking about said thing really just kind of like led me to keep doing the same thing over and over again. What we need is something new that captures our minds and our hearts. For me, it was as I turned to Christ and realized why I was going to what I was going to, I was able to stop thinking about as much. So with this, with the law, there's a misconception uh, regarding Jesus. Jesus was very thoroughly religious. He disagreed with religious leaders on a number of things, but he was thoroughly Jew, Jew, uh, Jewish. I'm not going to do my full deep dive. I took it out of the, the, the message, but um, there's a great book by Tara Burton, uh, called Strange Rights, which is about religions in a godless world, and she dives into how religion is a notoriously difficult word to define. Um, one of my a couple pretty funny definitions, Aldous Huxley, oh, Brave New World, are you familiar with him? Uh, he said uh, religion, something to the extent of religion is the price we pay for being intelligent and not yet intelligent enough. Uh, Karl Marx said that religion is the opium for the people. Sigmund Freud said it's like some form of childhood neurosis. Patrick, I think it was McNamara, uh, said that uh, try to define religion and you're going to start yourself an argument. Uh, if you start getting into like, well, is it you know people who believe in some form of higher power spiritual being? Well, that leaves out certain sects of like Zen Buddhism and other groups of people. Um, and then you start getting into the phrases like, well, I'm spiritual but not religious. But like, does that make sense if someone says I'm spiritual but not religious but then generally ascribes to you a particular religion? Like, is religion the identity box that we check on a form? Is it the community of people that we're with? Is it our spiritual habits and practices? Long story short, Tara Burton makes a case that uh, we are more religiously remixed, which is her term of saying that we pick and choose and are formed by all these different religious sources. Um, And she takes a broader view of saying religion is about where we find meaning or what we see is like the meaning of life, evil in the world, all this stuff. Purpose, what's our role in it? Uh, Community and then ritual or forms of habits or practices. So she actually, it's pretty interesting, she dives into a whole thing on uh, 
like the religion of CrossFit um, and the religion of like uh, the radical right and the radical left and uh, dives into like the rise of like spiritual, uh, spiritual things and Wiccanism and witchcraft and also Christianity and anyways, it's very, very fascinating um, and how we have taken all of these different pieces from all these different religions. Uh, my point with saying that um, is I don't think it's fair to say that you are spiritual but not religious. It's actually somewhat confusing. Jesus said this, uh, and especially if we're going to attribute something like that to Jesus. Jesus said this on Ma- in Matthew 5. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus certainly critiqued people holding on to religious ideologies and whatnot. But to say religion in and of itself is bad kind of misses the point of what Jesus is saying. So if religion is not the problem, then what is? Paul gets at it here. Sin. Sin is the problem. Okay, preacher. Great, great. Heard that one. So this word brings up a lot of things. Many of us probably immediately think of the list of shouldn'ts that we hear inside or the list of shouldn'ts that we heard from likely people like me. Cue whatever messages you've heard and that felt remarkably hateful. Talking about the sin out there but not dealing with the hatred in here. Paul's understanding of sin, though, is not something that only exists out there. It exists within him with power. And this is the one communicating the good news about Jesus, declaring regularly our freedom in Christ and writing beautiful things like in uh, 838, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. But he says that sin exists in him as something with power, power to destroy. He says things about sin producing death in him, even though, or even through, what is good. He says things like, I don't understand my own actions, and that I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And here's this dude writing some dense theology who seems to understand a lot of things, but yet, I can't understand why I am doing what I am doing. He says, so it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And previously, Paul dove into sin out there, but here he's really focusing in on the sin in here. We see there's a power to sin. No wonder it's hard to break bad habits and sin patterns. We see sin brings forth death that leads to destruction. We see a lot of things in Paul's teaching here. We often don't understand why we do the things we do. Have you found that to be true? Like, I didn't even want to do this. And yet I did it again. Oops. uh, You're welcome. I'm available in a couple weeks. Help. (laughs) Um, Paul gets at it here. Part of me doesn't want this, but there is another part within me that clearly does. And he says, my truest self, who I am created to be, delights in the law of God and my inner being. There is another power out there. There is a war of wants, of desires, of loves. In order to become who we are created to be, we need to call out what it is that is keeping us from that goal. And a key problem with both the hyper-religious and the anti-religious buddy Jesus is, I would argue, we don't have a robust enough understanding of sin. Because that will not lead to a robust enough understanding of God's grace and goodness. Because if we don't understand the depth of the problem in here and out there, we're not going to understand how good of news it is that in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Robert Robert Mulholland Jr. in his book, Invitation to a Journey, outlines four sort of layers of sin. First is what he calls gross sins. Not gross as in ooh, but gross as in obvious, like adultery and murder, things that generally across the board would be agreed upon as, that's bad, you shouldn't do that. Underneath that would be what he would refer to as conscious sins. These would be things that are more socially acceptable, but whatever thing that you know you shouldn't do but other people think is fine, that would fall under there. Underneath that is what he referred to as subconscious sins. These might be not sins of 
action, might be sins of omission or sins of motivation. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason. You did something altruistic, but actually you wanted people to praise you for being altruistic. You didn't actually care that much about other people. Or more likely, part of you did and part of you didn't. And then underneath that would be what he would refer to as trust structures or idols. Things that we find our ultimate meaning worth from. And I, I think oftentimes in our caricatures and understandings of sin, we mainly focus in on the gross and conscious sins. But I would argue actually as we become more mature in Jesus, we ought to become increasingly aware of the depth of sin in our own hearts. So for me, I used to not think I struggled with pride because I was really insecure. Several years ago, I realized I definitely struggled with pride, and that was just manifested often and typically as insecurity for me. But I struggled with pride when I was younger and didn't know it. Yes, I did. So what is the solution? You came to church today, so you can probably guess what I'm going to say. The answer is, Jesus, good job. <laughs> wow, I hated the way that that sounded. That sounded so <laughs> patronizing. Oh, I hate that. I'm sorry. thought it was going to be funny, and now I'm just, I'm dealing with my inner critic parts. But So then we get into... Paul has been saying, what a miserable person I am. I don't do what I want to do. And the thing that I want to do, I can't seem to get myself to do. Then he says this, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Not my condemnation. Not my, oh, what a miserable person I am. There's no condemnation. Not the condemnation from the church people and the people out there. Now in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. You mean not the condemnation I felt from my parents or the condemnation I felt from, you know, my church friends at one point who said those really hurtful. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul, like, didn't you just kind of condemn yourself? Yeah, but... My voice isn't the most powerful one here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And we learned in, we didn't read it together today, but in other places in Romans 3 that we are invited to partake in the family of God. And like this is by grace through faith as we see in Ephesians chapter 2. This is not of yourself. You didn't earn it. And 8 two, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And so Christ actually offers to reverse like these responses that we have of even pride, where we think we are better than others. Um, these might be verses, depending on your religious heritage, that you heard growing up as a way of like belittling other people. Uh, someone pointed this out to me who had been really belittled by other people because of his particular, uh, like who he is in life. Um, he pointed out how it's actually become good news to him. Romans 1.24. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. I know you're probably not liking this that much. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's body. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. And it goes on in verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking, and let them do things that should never be done. And it goes on to list a whole lot of other things. And I think we can often stop there, particularly the hyper-religious. Oh, can't believe you would do all these things. But this, Romans, was a letter. Now, uh, have you all ever written a letter before? Sent an email, text message? Do you normally put chapters when you write a letter? No. This did not originally have chapter numbers. So if we stopped there, that sounds like, oh, look at all those people out there. But what we, what we see is actually there is a lengthier section that comes to this. Chapter 2, verse 1. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And he goes on to talk about that for quite some time. He says, there's no advantage to being a Jew. In fact, if you know it and then you miss it, that's kind of worse. Goes on to say things like, you tell other people not to steal, but then you steal. 
And then Romans 2, 24, the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. Have you stopped to consider that their problem might actually be because of you? We get so caught up in like there's sin out there, but there is sin in here. Romans 3 talks about like, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we see in Romans 3, 20 that we're not saved by some special sort of knowledge. It changes our primary motivation of being that of finger pointing out to realizing the problem is not them. The problem is sin, and it's in here. And actually, the more in tune I get with God, the deeper I realize that problem is that I need healing of. For finger pointing, it moves us to like not only recognize the evil out there, but to recognize the ways in which we have missed the mark. There's a popular verse, Matthew 7, verse 4. It says, how can you think of saying your friend, to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So there's two things in here. First, uh, get rid of the log in your own eye. The hyper-religious tendency would say, they've got a log and I don't, I'm pretty good. Uh, the buddy Jesus one might be on a, the other end of like saying, I ain't really got a speck. There's two things in here. Get rid of the log in your own eye and then you can help with the speck in your friend's eye. For fear, it moves us, Jesus invites to move us from fear of not doing enough to realizing and recognizing the depth that Christ has done enough. He has loved me. I'm no longer a slave to fear and to my sin. I am a child of God if I follow Jesus. Adopted into God's family, it moves me from a fear of legalism or having to do things to make God happy to living a whole new type of life oriented around love where your practices are formed not simply out of obligation, but center on love. It moves us from this misplaced conviction to reorienting our life around loving God and loving neighbor. So, you've got a battle, this internal conflict. What do we do? First, recognize it. Recognize what the issue is. Label it. I invite you to say it out loud or write it down. Say it to God, to another person. Repent. But I think a better invitation comes directly from Jesus is I'm, I'm going to invite Carly to come back up. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I read that and I think, well, Jesus, I've like tried coming to you many a time. And I'm still quite tired. In fact, I just right now feel guilty that I haven't come to you enough. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. I'm gonna read this uh, from, from the message, a paraphrase of this passage. And as we sing this next song, I just want to um, invite you to bring that internal battle before the Lord. There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that um, says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, um, let us run the race with endurance, keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now seated at the right hand of God. This is an invitation to turn our battles and like bring them directly to him. So if you want someone to just be in the presence of God with you or pray with you, I'll be right in the back and would love to do that. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly.
And if I may, when it comes to either of these caricatures of Jesus, I think oftentimes there's like a, a list of shoulds that we have before we come to Jesus. I should be doing whatever more. can't earn it. You can't work your way towards it. He wants a relationship with you. And actually realizing the depth of our sin helps us better understand his grace and operate in the freedom that comes in that. So if you've come in today and you feel these voices of condemnation over you saying, what a miserable person I am. I told myself I wouldn't do that again. I know better. There's an invitation for you because there is therefore, and the question is, if this says therefore, what is the therefore? It's talking about all of these things about how miserable I feel. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can belong in the family of God, and if you follow after Jesus, you are an adopted child of God. Your primary identity now is one of saint and not sinner. So if that's you, and you just need someone to sit with you, I'll be right back there, I and mean, I'll pray for us as we, uh, as we sing this song together. Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it blessed you and helped you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. We pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.